we tend to associate the word diplomacy with embassies, international relations and high politics, but it really refers to a set of skills that matter in many areas of daily life, especially at the office and on the landing outside the slammed doors of loved ones' bedrooms. Diplomacy is the art of advancing an idea or cause without unnecessarily inflaming passions or unleashing a catastrophe. It involves an understanding of the many facets of human nature that can undermine agreement and stoke conflict, and a commitment to unpicking these with foresight and grace. The diplomat remembers first and foremost that some of the vehemence with which we can insist on having our way draws energy from an overall sense of not being respected or heard within a relationship. We will fight with particular tenacity and apparent meanness over a so-called small thing when we have the sense that the other person has failed to honour our wider need for appreciation and esteem. Behind our fierce way of arguing may lie a frustrated plea for affection. Diplomats know the intensity with which humans crave respect, and so though they may not always be able to agree with us, they take the trouble to show that they have bothered to see how things look through our eyes. They recognise that it's almost as important to people to feel heard as to win their case. We'll put up with a lot once someone has demonstrated that they at least know how we feel. Diplomats therefore put extraordinary effort into securing the health of the overall relationship so that smaller points can be conceded along the way without attracting feelings of untenable humiliation. They know how much beneath pitched fights over money or entitlements, schedules or procedures, a demand for esteem can stir. They are careful to trade generously in emotional currency so as not always to have to pay excessively in other, more practical denominations. Frequently, what's at stake within a negotiation with someone is a request that they change in some way, that they learn to be more punctual or take more trouble on a task, that they be less defensive or more open-minded. The diplomat knows how futile it is to state these wishes too directly, they know the vast difference between having a correct diagnosis of how someone needs to grow and a relevant way to help them actually do so. They know too that what holds people back from evolution is fear and therefore grasp that what we may most need to offer those whom we want to acknowledge difficult things is, above anything else, love and reassurance. It helps greatly to know that those recommending change are not speaking from a position of impregnable perfection, but are themselves wrestling with comparable demons in other areas. For a diagnosis not to sound like mere criticism, it helps for it to be delivered by someone with no compunctions to owning up to their own shortcomings. There can be few more successful pedagogic moves than to confess genially from the outset and I am, of course, entirely mad as well. In negotiations, a diplomat is not addicted to indiscriminate or heroic truth-telling. They appreciate the legitimate place that minor lies can occupy in the service of greater truths. They know that if certain local facts are emphasised, then the most important principles in a relationship may be forever undermined. So, they will enthusiastically say that the financial report or the homemade cake were really very pleasing, and will do so not to deceive, but to affirm the truth of their overall attachment, which might be lost were a completely accurate account of their feelings to be laid out. Diplomats know that a small lie may have to be the guardian of a big truth. They appreciate their own resistance to the unvarnished facts and privately hope that others may, on occasion, over certain matters, also take the trouble to lie to them and that they will never realise. Another trait of the diplomat is to be serene in the face of obviously bad behaviour, a sudden loss of temper, a wild accusation, a very mean remark. They don't take it personally, even when they may be the target of rage. They reach instinctively for reasonable explanations and have clearly in their minds the better moments of a currently frantic but essentially lovable person. 
they know themselves well enough to understand that abandonments of perspective are both hugely normal and usually indicative of nothing much beyond exhaustion or passing despair. They don't aggravate a febrile situation through self-righteousness, which is a symptom of not knowing oneself too well and of having a very selective memory. The person who bangs a fist on the table or renounces extravagant opinions may simply be rather worried, frightened, or just very enthusiastic, conditions that should rightly invite sympathy rather than disgust. At the same time, the diplomat understands that there are moments to sidestep direct engagement. They don't try to teach a lesson whenever it might first or most apply. They wait until it has the best chance of being heard. At points, they disarm difficult people by reacting in unexpected ways. In the face of a tirade, instead of going on the defensive, the diplomatic person might suggest some lunch. When a harshly unfair criticism is launched at them, they might nod in partial agreement and declare that they've often said such things themselves. They give a lot of ground away and avoid getting cornered in arguments that distract from the deeper issues. They remember the presence of a better version of what might be a somewhat unfortunate individual currently on display. The diplomat's tone of reasonableness is built fundamentally on a base of deep pessimism. They know what the human animal is, they understand how many problems are going to beset even a very good marriage, business, friendship or society. Their good-humoured way of greeting problems is a symptom of having swallowed a healthy measure of sadness from the outset. They've given up on the ideal, not out of weakness, but out of a mature readiness to see compromise as a necessary requirement for getting by in a radically imperfect world. The diplomat may be polite, but they're not for that matter averse to sometimes delivering bits of bad news with uncommon frankness. Too often we seek to preserve our image in the eyes of others by tiptoeing around the harsh decisions, and thereby make things far worse than they need to be. We should say that we're leaving them, that they're fired, that their pet project isn't going ahead, but we mutter instead that we're a little preoccupied at the moment, that we're delighted by their performance and that the project is being actively discussed by the senior team. We mistake leaving some room for hope with kindness. But true kindness does not mean seeming kind. It means helping the people we're going to disappoint to adjust as best they can to reality. By administering a sharp, clean blow, the diplomatic person kills off the torture of hope accepting the frustration that's likely to come their way. The diplomat is kind enough to let themselves be the target of hate. The diplomat succeeds ultimately because they are a realist. They know that we are inherently flawed, unreasonable, anxious, comedically absurd creatures who scatter blame unfairly, misdiagnose their pains and react appallingly to criticisms, especially when it's accurate. And yet, diplomats are hopeful too of the possibilities of progress when our disturbances have been properly factored in and cushioned with adequate reassurance. Diplomacy seeks to teach us how many good things can still be accomplished when we make some necessary accommodations with a crooked, sometimes touching and hugely unreliable material of human nature. If you're interested in coming to San Francisco to meet us at the end of March, please click on the link on the screen now to find out more. We hope to see you there.